Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's Victor Rosatowski, your lowly chancellor, saying hello to you all. It's exactly seven o'clock right now, so I'm going to try to start on time. I want to wish everyone a very happy new year and especially a wonderful feast of our Lord's Epiphany. I'm uh, standing in uh, for Margie. She's a bit under the weather uh, right now, as probably uh, many of your family members, maybe even yourselves are. Uh, so I was going to be on the call, uh, Zoom call anyway, of course. I wanted to hear Father Hugh Barber. Uh, so I, uh, I'm happy to step in uh, for, for Margie. And uh, we're going to have some um, beautiful reflections on the Epiphany as we pray through the Rosary. And I'd like to begin uh, with a prayer, if I could. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, receiver of the wise men and their gifts, help us follow the light in the midst of our dark world. Fix our eyes and hearts on your light, that we may be the bearers of that light to all those who walk in the dark. Amen. So I wanted to begin with a little prelude, um, because, you know, from a personal standpoint, today is uh, the last day that uh, our Christmas decorations are going to be up. And, and tomorrow, we, we're taking them down, and we're getting ready to do that, and so I'm, I'm kind of trying to enjoy the last day, uh, because we have extensive uh, Christmas decorations at our house. My, my wife, Mary Beth, goes, goes all out, and so it's a couple of hundred boxes of stuff that needs to be put away. And so I was particularly uh, looking at the Christmas creches that we have collected over the years. And I think we have uh, around 50 of them uh, on display in the house of every type uh, from every country uh, that we have visited and most of the different cities we have uh, visited in our travels. And some are made from wood, um, from lead, uh, from glass, from porcelain, uh, from sand, um, for even from ivory. Um, and uh, so as I was looking at those, uh, the ones, uh, several of them, have the scene of the shepherds and the three kings in, in the creche, you know, with Mary and, Je Mary and Joseph and Jesus, of course, in the center. Um, and I tried to think about, okay, so what is uh, the artist trying to display here? Because I'm pretty sure that those events did not happen at the same time in the same place, according to my Bible reading. But of course, artistic license allows you uh, to put them together to, to send a message. And I'm trying to think about the message that uh, these artists are trying to portray. And it occurred to me that, well, a couple of different messages. One is sort of the first day of Christmas is when the shepherds were there. And the 12th day of Christmas is when the three kings are there. So you have the full song right in front of you, the 12 days of Christmas, right? And then I also thought about the juxtaposition of these two groups of people. On one hand, you have the Jewish shepherds who hear the message from God through his angels and believe, and it's a short walk to get to the manger to see Jesus because they are men, they are men of faith. And on the other hand, you have these very wealthy kings, very successful and educated. They're far away. They're from the east. And they walk a long way to find this baby Jesus. And they use a combination of science, astronomy, and their understanding of the prophecies, scripture, readings. They're pretty intellectual people. The shepherds, on the other hand, probably don't have a formal education, don't have much wealth. They have some of the lowliest jobs, you know, that you can get. The kings have reached the pinnacle of success in their society. So we have these two cultures, and to me it speaks of the universal, 
the universal church, that God is here, that Jesus is here as a savior, as Messiah, not for just the Jewish people, certainly for the Jewish people, but really for the entire world. And so this universality is depicted, you know, in, in our uh, faith, the Catholic faith, because in Greek, Catholic means universal. And to me, that's what the creche is about. It's the calling of God to everyone. And there are so many different ways, whether we're far or near, doesn't matter. God will find a way for us to find him. So with that, I'd like to um, thank our San Diego Council and Chapter uh, for, again, providing another, um, this is the January reflection. In December, for those of you that were able to participate, we had the Advent reflection uh, with Bishop Bajarano. And through that event led to, to this event, and we have to thank uh, Clay and Ann Hoffman uh, for organizing this and putting together um, this, this session and getting uh, Father Hugh Barber to, uh, to speak to us. So I'm gonna tur turn it over now to, uh, to Clay to introduce uh, Father Hugh. So Clay, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Victor. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce a very dear friend to many of us, Father Hugh Barber. Briefly, uh, Father Barber is a native of Pasadena. He grew up in Southern California. His father was a longtime Episcopalian priest in Pasadena. And uh, Father took his undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina before going to Rome, where he earned his doctorate at the Angelicum. He was ordained as a Norbertine priest in 1990. And um, this is an interesting time for the Norbertines because on Christmas, just a few weeks ago, it was the 900th anniversary of the founding of the Norbertine order in France. Uh, Father Hugh has held many positions throughout his priestly life. For many years, he's, he served as prior at St. Michael's Abbey in Silverado. And more recently, he's been the chaplain at Catholic Answers here in San Diego. He's a speaker, a lecturer, an author. He has led several retreats at our annual meetings, and he's a knight commander of the Equestrian Order. So uh, also, I wanted to say that as Father Hugh goes through his talk, on three occasions, we'll be pausing as a group to pray the, a decade of the rosary. And on each of those occasions, we'll be led by members who have been chosen uh, um, members of our lieutenancy. So Father Hugh, uh, please proceed on. Well, great, uh, wonderful to be here on this Epiphany Eve uh, and um, taking some points that uh, Victor already brought up that are, that are actually uh, very much in line with some of the things that I'm about to say. Um, there's always a connection between the feasts of the church and uh, nothing in traditional Catholic art or liturgy is by accident. Um, and so very much so in particular the calendar and the, 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 the cycle of feasts that we celebrate. The Magi of course are called Magi, not because they're magicians exactly, but because they were wise men uh, who were principally astrologers or astronomers. Back then, there was no difference between astronomy and astrology because um, they lived in the world such as God intended to be seen for the purposes of the original revelation. If you think about it, God wanted the original revelation of the Old Testament and also the New to take place in a world where everything could be seen according to the measure of human nature. That is, the universe seen from the face of the earth not the microscopic world, not uh, the world of atoms, not the world of galaxies billions of miles away, but the world that we can see with our own senses because faith comes through our senses. And so revelation not being uh, a, a discussion of scientific particularities still responds to what people see when they look out into the night sky or when they see the shining sun or the phases of the moon. And that's where really a religious and scientific reflection began by looking up and considering the courses of the stars, the planets, and the position of the earth in relation to all that, and these immense powers 
that were regarded as godlike, if not gods, directing the courses of natural events and human events. That was the natural presupp natural supposition of ancient people that those heavenly bodies who followed a strict pattern year after year after year had to be the, the things which actually governed uh, the universe in terms of particular lives, as well as nations, and as well as nature itself. So the church's liturgy, just like the, the worship of any other religion, and this is no argument against our worship, but rather an argument that it corresponds to what human nature needs, took its start from the consideration of the winter solstice, the summer solstice, the vernal equinox, the autumnal equinox. You look at the feasts that you'll find there, Christmas at the, at the winter solstice, the birth of John the Baptist at the summer solstice, the days get lighter when Christ comes, and then as he must increase and I must decrease, the days get shorter as John the Baptist appears, for, as, as one example. And then there are many others as well. The phase of the moon, which governed the worship of the old covenant, and also some aspects, some churches of the, of the new covenant, the, the Ethiopians and the Copts. But there's always a reference, a calendar means a, some kind of reference to the, the universe as perceived by ancient man not by modern man. We don't have a calendar based upon uh, uh, the Hubble or the, the, the new one they have that's even more amazing. It wouldn't work, okay? Our 24-hour days, our minutes, they are as basic and as antique and as unscientific as anything you could imagine. And yet they're not superstition, they're signs. God made the universe to be a sign to us, and the signs we can see most visibly and most obviously with our simple human nature standing and looking out from the face of the earth are the ones that appeal the most to the universal human race. Our Lord didn't reveal a religion which is only for the scientifically learned, but for all human beings who have the same experience on the face of the earth, looking out and looking about. So those Magi were among the elite of such men and they had discovered a significant sign in the sky that did not follow the regular rhythm of the planets and therefore had to be a miraculous prodigy, had to, had to be a sign of something uh, out of the ordinary and, and uh, supernatural. So that's why they followed it. Otherwise, you know, the courses of the, of the, the, the zodiac and the sun and the moon and all of that are so stable, they, would, they wouldn't have any need to follow this. But there's the sign in the sky that led them to the stable, that was a miraculous sign. Sometimes you read articles about how there was a conjunction of Jupiter and this and that at that time. And well, no, but actually the way the scriptures presented, this star that led them was a star unlike any other. What kind of star shows people the way all the way from Chaldea to Palestine and also can shine over one single house, right? We're, we're talking about a prodigy, a charism, if you will, that they received. So the church's liturgy, has been based from the very beginning on two poles, the, 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 the revelation of our Lord's incarnation of the Virgin Mary and the Paschal mystery of his passion, death and resurrection. And Epiphany, in fact, is an older feast than Christmas. And in the very ancient church, and this still exists in some, for example, the Armenian church celebrates just one Christmas, which is today, uh, the Epiphany celebrated these mysteries first of the incarnation and then of the passion resurrection compendiously on a single feast day we have we, we spread it out through holy week but you can see very well in the feast of the epiphany in our liturgy of our own catholic church how many things are brought together to show the manifestation of the son of god made flesh to the world so uh we're, we're looking at one of the poles of the church's year one of the most ancient pole along with easter those are the two foundations. Christmas originally began in the Roman church as a celebration of the maternity and virginal childbearing of Our Lady. And that's why the octave of Christmas is a Marian feast day. But the feast in January was precisely a feast of the manifestation of the word made flesh to the Gentiles and to the Jewish people and in his first miracle. And so the church in her liturgy, especially in liturgy of the hours, you don't see it as much in the mass, celebrates on this feast day, the coming of the wise men, the baptism of the Lord in the Jordan, and the wedding feast at Cana, and the miraculous change of water into wine. That's what we, the, all those things we celebrate. The three original manifestations, when the apostles first began to believe in Christ, 
when he was first revealed as the Father's beloved Son, with the Spirit testifying to that. And of course, when the three wise men came and found him, whom they were looking for, but whom they did not know. And so consequently, it's a feast of um, tremendous depth and breadth. And we can meditate on all these things during this season, this epiphany season. They used to call it Sundays after Epiphany. And so uh, up until up until February 2nd. In fact, Victor, you can in some countries you can you can keep your decorations up until February 2nd. If you want to, if you feel too tired tomorrow, just you can keep them up. Um, in any case, um, so what we have here is a feast which celebrates the word made flesh. First, proceeding from God the Father from all eternity, taking flesh of the Virgin Mary, and then manifested to the Gentiles and then shown forth to the Jewish people at the baptism, and then revealed especially to his disciples, because we, we read that at Cana, his disciples first believe in, believed in him because they saw his glory. So these are all feasts of glory, the glory of the star, uh, the glory of the Father's manifestation, and uh, confirmation that this was the beloved Son, and the sin of the Spirit, and then also the glory of our Lord's first miracle. So we have many beautiful things to consider and this, of course, can prepare us to see in just what context we should see the later, the Paschal mystery and the different things that lead up to it uh, when we are celebrating uh, in Holy Week and at Easter. So with, th with that, let's consider our first mystery. And I take to begin, before we begin saying the Our Father, the antiphon for at Vespers, the little chant that goes before the singing of the Canticle of Mary, the Magnificat the one for first Vespers of the Feast of the Epiphany, which focuses on the single event of the arrival of the wise men. And this is from our church's liturgy. Seeing the star, seeing the star, the wise men said, this must signify the birth of some great king. Let us search for him and lay our treasures at his feet, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was at the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Now we turn to the mystery of our Lord's baptism in the Jordan. The Eastern churches celebrate almost exclusively the baptism of the Lord on Epiphany, which they often call the Feast of the Theophany, it means practically the same thing. Epiphany means a showing forth, Theophany means a showing forth of God. And of course, as we'll hear this Sunday in the gospel, uh, we will, on the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, as you can see, it, it spins out of Epiphany, and it's really one with it. Traditionally, Epiphany, the Baptism of the Lord, was celebrated in the Roman Church on the octave of, of the Epiphany. So on the 13th of January, you had the commemoration of our Lord's Baptism. But in any case, it's a season in which both of these mysteries are celebrated. Later on, they had the Gospel of the, of the, um, of the changing of water into wine. But what is it that our Lord accomplishes for us in being baptized in the Jordan? He wasn't a sinner. He wasn't even a disciple of John the Baptist. Quite the contrary, uh, John the Baptist was his disciple. And the baptism which John gave was the baptism of repentance. Uh, again, our Lord was not a sinner. Nor was it the baptism of the New Testament. But it was necessary, as the fathers of the church tell us, that our Lord, and this is a beautiful thought, and it's a true one, uh, that, uh, that he forever after that sanctified water to be the immediate matter of the sacrament of baptism in the new law, the sacrament which he would institute and command us to administer as he ascended into heaven. So we see there's a connection between the, 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 the Lord's baptism and also his ascension to heaven. The fruits of his resurrection, the saints ascending with him, liberated from the limbo of the just and now going glorious to heaven are, are so in virtue of the command of Christ to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But our Lord accomplishes this mystery of his baptism and the blessing of the waters, literally the original blessing of the waters. We also bless holy water, but let's just say all water can be used for baptism. And that's already an amazing thing that it has in it latent needing only the form of the sacrament and a recipient who is unbaptized to leash forth all the blessings of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, faith, hope, and charity, and the, the hope of eternal life and conformity to Christ, even in his passion. So a great thing occurs when our Lord, in his humility, taking the form of a slave, as St. Paul says, takes the position of a sinner. Remember, St. Paul says he was made sin for our sake, and so he who knew no sin underwent a baptism of repentance. This perplexed some of his followers, but uh, the meaning is clear that it is through our Lord's humility, both as God in becoming one of us and as man in identifying himself with sinners, uh, that he merits and exemplifies to us the source of our salvation. That submission of the heart to God, that openness to his will and design, and that willingness to make progress, however slowly, in the ways of holiness. We poor, proud sinners that we are. So let's put all our trust in the Savior and in his power to sanctify us through his great humility in which he came in Bethlehem and also at the Jordan. And let's listen to the antiphon for the Canticle of Zechariah for the morning of Epiphany in the church's worship. These are all things we've sung in the Abbey Church today, um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're used to hearing them. Today the bridegroom claims his bride, the church, since Christ has washed her sins away in Jordan's waters. The Magi hasten with their gifts to the royal wedding, and the wedding guests rejoice, for Christ has changed water into wine. So all three mysteries taken together in that beautiful image of the marriage of God with man. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but lose from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh, oh, my, my Jesus. Jesus Forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. The wedding feast at Cana really and truly brings together some themes for our spiritual life, which are indispensable for us, especially as Catholics. First of all, we have depicted in the most immediate way in a gospel, uh, according to John, which does not have a narration of our Lord's infancy, uh, but shows immediately Our Lady and Our Lord as a grown man, relating in a manner which shows the extraordinary role which she was given in salvation. Certainly, that's already shown in her virginal conception and virginal childbearing and her being the mother of the Son of God. But that her role continues and continues in a way which is personal and specific and concrete and that involves her relationship with Jesus is to us an incredible mystery and a very helpful model and an inspiration for confidence in prayer, to, especially to her. Our Lady as a widow with an unmarried son would have pretty much been accompanied by him everywhere. Uh, widows didn't go out by themselves if they weren't accompanied by some male member of their family. We mustn't be too hard on the Muslims who insist on this. These customs are very, very ancient, and we may not have them anymore for various and sometimes various very good reasons, but um, in any case, she would have been such a one. So the mother of Jesus was invited to the wedding, and so she tells Jesus, I've been invited to a wedding, so that means you're going to take me, and so he did. A wedding was given at Cana and the mother of Jesus was there. That's already an amazing characterization. This is about Mary as much as it's about Jesus. Now, she notices that they don't have any wine. And so she comes to him and says, son, they have no wine. And he says, what is that to you and to me, woman? Amazing. Now, some people will interpret that as an indication that Our Lady's role is not as lofty as we hold it to be, but it's quite the contrary. You'll notice in the lives of the saints, the closer a saint is, and particularly female saints, to our Lord, the more he makes them companions with him in his struggle and his sufferings. 
the fewer consolations he gives them, although the consolations he does give are extraordinary indeed. And you'll see with Our Lady, he, uh, he, he never responds to her uh, as though he's trying to console her or make her feel better. When he's found in the temple, she said, your father and I are sorrowing and seeking you. And he said, why did you seek me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? It's a pretty harsh sounding answer. And when she was seeking him outside in the crowd, and uh, he says, who is my mother and who is my brother? But the one who hears the, who, who hears the will of God and keeps it. Our Lady was our Lord's companion in the redemption. And therefore, he held her to a standard which was very rigorous. She's the mother of all the living, the new Eve, uh, the mother of the church, and in a term which is very well, uh, very well established in Catholic theology, although recently brought into uh, uh, confusion, she's the co-redemptrix. That is, she didn't redeem us as Christ did, but she was his associate at every step in redeeming the human race, from his conception to his death and even beyond his resurrection. And she's also there at Pentecost, She's always there. She is the co-worker, the privileged co-worker, a unique and singular co-worker. And so when our Lord says this to her, she doesn't uh, act hurt or shed a tear. How can you talk to me that way? Doesn't he know I'm his nice Jewish mother? No, she simply turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Because she knows that if what she has asked is in accordance with his will, that it will be accomplished. And she kind of knows that he's going to do it. Because our Lord would not want the, the, the bride and groom and the family of the, of the bride to be embarrassed on this occasion. And so he works that first miracle of a very practical nature, the kind of miracle cooked up by a wife and a mother who understood the particularities and the strains of a wedding celebration. Imagine all the chatter that would have been going on about the family and about the mother of the family and everything if they'd run out of wine and weren't able to get any more. So our Lord worked that miracle for a very practical purpose. It's as though if our, if our lady could have said, go out to the store and get some wine, that would have been the kind of thing that might have happened to us as children. But um, back when children could buy wine at stores, I, I remember that, at least in my neighborhood. Anyway, if they knew your parents. So our Lord works this miracle at our lady's intercession but practically at her command, because he doesn't say, yes, I'm going to do it. And the command she gives is to the servants, but she commands with the, with the authority of Christ, representing him and his divine power, which alone could change wine water directly into wine. And so he does. And this miracle uh, is uh, all the more remarkable because it's the miracle whereby our Lord chooses to manifest his glory to his disciples. So he desired to manifest himself in his first miracle wrought openly and clearly through the intercession of his mother and for an eminently practical purpose uh, and not something that would show him in some sort of light as a wonder worker. Hardly anyone noticed what had happened except those who were up close. And of course they were amazed, but the, the feelings of the family were spared and the wine was very good as the steward made clear. We should have great confidence in the intercession of the mother of God. And when we find ourselves running short of what we need financially, we can start there. Our Lord started with finances. Almost half the parables talk about money. So he knows that's something that worries people. Financially, in terms of health, in terms of relationships, all the lacks and the needs we have and those we notice in others, we should flee to her run to her and say, mother, we don't have this, we don't have that. Tell your son to supply it for us. And if we pray with confidence and persistence, we will obtain what we need. God doesn't always answer our prayers precisely the way we want them answered. But the theological reason for that is because whenever he does not answer a prayer for some good thing, it's because he has something better for us. And just as little children, ask their parents for things and the parents say no because they know, they know it wouldn't be good for the child and because they have something better in mind for them even though the child doesn't appreciate it we are just like children in this regard with our very complicated uh, professional and familial and social needs and 
but most especially our spiritual needs, because the kind of prayers which are always answered the way we want are the prayers for faith, for hope, for charity, for supernatural gifts, for pardon. Think of the, think of the uh, act of contrition. That always works, even in people who have committed mortal sin, because the prayer is so important, the reconciliation of a sinner to God, that God will not refuse the grace to someone who contritely says, I'm sorry for my sins because I love you above all things and I fear your punishments. God will grant that prayer, however you feel about it, it's going to happen. But for lesser things, he has either in mind to give us those lesser things we ask for or to give us better things if we're patient enough to wait. And Our Lady certainly can teach us to be patient in prayer. As you well know, and perhaps better than I, it requires a lot of patience to persevere. And so uh, Our Lady can teach us that, even in the midst of uh, all of the various events of our human life. So let us meditate on this mystery of our Lord's changing of water into wine at the intercession of Our Lady, hearing this, can't, this uh, anaphon from this evening's evening prayer, uh, which brings together all of the themes of this feast day. Three mysteries mark this holy day. Today the star leads the Magi to the infant Christ. Today water is changed into wine for the wedding feast. Today Christ wills to be baptized by John in the river Jordan to bring us salvation. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, um, we'd like to thank you for a very enriching and faith-inspiring talk. Uh, my wife, Anne, was taking notes throughout your talk, and I know that she and I will reflect on this evening for some time. Thank you very, very much. You're very welcome. Um, we have a little time left for some questions. So if anyone would like to unmute themselves and be prepared to ask Father a question. While we're doing that, I think I'll start with a question. Uh, Father Hugh, do we know anything about the fate of the Magi after they returned to the East? 
Well, uh, in the tradition of, uh, of the church, uh, the, the relics of the three wise men were brought from Syria to Milan. Uh, Milan was an imperial city, and for a very long time, the emperors, the Western emperors lived there. And that was even, you know, that was, that was a residence. Ravenna was one, and Milan was another. Also, Trier in Germany was another imperial city, so the court moved around. It didn't very often live in, live in Rome in, in late antiquity. So the relics were brought there to a church in Milan, but then as the focus of the Western Roman Empire moved north after Charlemagne um, and uh, became established uh, first in Aachen and then finally in Cologne, they moved the relics of the three kings to Cologne. And if you've ever been to Cologne Cathedral, behind the altar, there's a magnificent 13th century reliquary that's just mind-blowingly beautiful. It's just magnificent. It's just a, a marvel of, uh, of art and craftsmanship. And when you make a pilgrimage there, uh, you walk underneath it. Uh, that was the ancient way of venerating the relics of a saint. The, 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 um, the, the reliquary was above you and you walked underneath. And that, that's true in these, very many of them. And I, I myself was happy to do that on one occasion and an diocesan pilgrimage there in, in Cologne. Now, you, someone might say, for, for heaven's sakes, you know, that how do they know that these are the three kings? Well, there's not, you know, absolute uh, historical proof, but let's just say um, we have a, tra a trail that goes at least from the, from the, 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 the early 300s until the present. And in the present, they did a study of uh, the relics of the three kings who were there in the, uh, in the, in the shrine there in Cologne. And uh, they examined the uh, fabric in which they had been wrapped. And the fabric, the, the, that which remained of it, was proven to be, and the, and, the, the, uh, and the Diocese of Cologne has a book about this, and you know, the German church is not into uh, devotional exaggerations. You know, that kind of thing is very much out of style in Germany. So when they publish a book like this, it, it means, you know, it's, 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 it has a certain, um, you might say, reverse credibility because they're, they're of a certain ecclesiology that doesn't like this sort of thing anyway. And so when they actually back it up, you know, of course they've got millions of pilgrims coming, so they, they need not to de-emphasize it too much. But the fabric that was used, the silk uh, uh, fabric and the snatches of it that they analyzed located it both as to design and, uh, and uh, manner of weaving to first century Syria. What can you say? You can say, well, I don't know if this is Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. I don't even know if th those are their names. But what I do know is that the remains that were held to be of the three kings, and there are three kings there, three, three remains, uh, were wrapped in, in cloth that comes from first century Syria, which is where the three kings came from. Syria meaning, you know, Chaldea, which is that Syria is a very large uh, area. It's much larger than political Syria. It includes Palestine and it includes uh, the, the Iraq, for example, and some parts of Iran. And so there's a, a kind of historical indication that there's a credibility uh, and, a, and a serious credibility to the, the tradition of the three kings being moved by uh, the imperial order to the imperial court in Milan and then moved up to the imperial um, church and cathedral in Cologne. Uh, and the cloth seems to bear this out. So it's just uh, one little detail. Um, but I rather, I rather tend to believe it myself. But, you know, you take it or leave it. But there were three kings, or maybe five. Some people say there were five, but let's just say there the, are three gifts and three kings, which seems to make sense. Well, thank Father, you very much. I have a, I have a question. question. Yeah. Do we know anything of their lineage? Oh, the lineage of, of, of the three kings. Um, well, the, what we know is that they're Chaldeans. In, 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 in the rest Western Christian tradition, they're depicted more to emphasize the theme of manifestation of Christ to the nations. And so there's one who's black, there's one who's an Arab, and there's one who is, you know, um, a Syrian. And so that's the tradition, but one would assume they were all Chaldeans. Uh, we even have a rite in the Catholic Church called the Chaldean Rite, which are the original Chaldeans um, from Babylon uh, who, uh, who, who speak in that language in their villages and families and whatnot. So um, 
but it could well be that who knows but i mean there's a tradition in, in western iconography uh in the in the, in the latin church the roman church of having the different races together and there's always one who's black one who's an arab and one who's uh, an aramaic or syrian type yeah but those are you know it, it is what it is yeah if anyone else has a question please speak up um uh, f father i'm um, have one perhaps final question for you. Do, do we know the precise location of our Lord's baptism at the River Jordan? Well, um, it's certainly uh, south of Jericho, you know, uh, on the way to the Dead Sea, um, and not the way now a lot of evangelical Protestant pilgrimages, they have big baptism ceremonies uh, at the Jordan at, at its inception at the at the Lake of Galilee or of Genesareth. Uh, but that's because uh, the, 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 the Israeli government has dammed it up to make the fields fertile up in that part um, and lessen the water that goes down to the Palestinians. And so if you go to the Jordan now where the churches are that commemorate our Lord's baptism, you'll find, you know, a little better than a trickle, but not exactly a, 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 a raging river, uh, but just, just something that would be a little uh, uncomfortable to, to, uh, to cross. But the traditional site is just right there uh, south of Jericho um, with the churches on the Jordanian side. Uh, so you can stand there longingly uh, as a pilgrim on the Israeli side and would like to visit the churches, but you can't because you'd have to go all the way around again, to visit it, but it's all there. And the custom is, 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 is largely among the Eastern Orthodox is to bathe in the Jordan, um, uh, taking um, a white uh, garment and sort of commemorating baptism again by, by, um, by uh, immersing oneself in the Jordan. And of course, they perform baptisms there, and so do we. And there's a custom of taking water from the Jordan for baptisms in the States. You sometimes come across that people will bring Jordan water for the baptism of their child. Well, thank you. Um, if there are no additional questions. Uh, uh, I've got one additional question, Clay. Um, Father, I, I've heard it, I read somewhere a long time ago, the theory that the three Magi from the Chaldeans, that they were potentially um, remnants of, of the tribe of Judah from the Babylonian exile. And that's how they knew of the uh, prophesied king. Is there any merit to that? I don't see why there wouldn't be. I haven't studied that particular question, uh, but but it sounds interesting and, and at least plausible, you know, because, I mean, so many things went on in that area. And uh, and the Old Testament, of course, is full of uh, of um, reminiscences of their time in Babylon, even even in the use of language, because some parts of the Old Testament are written in uh, in uh, Chaldean. So some, some short, short passages. So not unlikely. But I haven't studied the question, so I can't really tell you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, if there are no other questions, once again, Father, thank you for an extraordinary evening. Uh, at this time, we'll turn it over to our Chancellor, Victor. And let me give you a blessing before we finish up, okay? So through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother, our Savior, the light of the nations, with the intercession of the three kings, and of all God's holy ones, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Before we uh, end with the prayer, I, I was just going to tell um, Father Barber that um, you have uh, provided so much content in this short time frame uh, for me to, uh, to think about and reflect upon. I'm actually going to have to skip uh, watching the Clippers basketball game uh, <laughs> and, and think about, ponder and reflect and meditate on, uh, on everything that I have learned today. So, so thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very much. You would show yourself thereby to be a wise man, <laughs> contemplating heavenly things. Yes, yes. Uh, and I also want to thank, you know, in the background, uh, uh, Lauren and Sophia Dodd, who, who do all of these wonderful technology things to, uh, to provide to us, and, and everyone who was part of the, uh, of the Rosary uh, and, and the San Diego um, 
council and, and members of the San Diego group. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. So let's, uh, we, we have a, uh, a different and new prayer, and I'd like to uh, uh, go ahead and, and read that uh, for you, uh, for the Knights and Dames of the Holy Sepulchre. O Lord Jesus Christ, for your five wounds that we carry on our insignia, we pray to you. Give us the strength to love all whom you, whom your Father has created, and more so, our enemies. Free our souls and hearts from sin, from partiality, from egoism, and from cowardice, so that we can be worthy of your sacrifice. Let your Spirit fall upon us all the knights and dames of the Holy Sepulchre, so that it may render us as convinced and sincere ambassadors of peace and love among our brothers and sisters, and especially among all those who think they do not believe in you. Give us faith to face all the problems of everyday life and to deserve one day to approach humbly, but without fear. Amen. Our Lady Queen of Palestine, pray for us. For us. And pray for a special intention Father Hugh has for tomorrow afternoon. I just add that in. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. God bless you all on this wonderful feast day. Good night. Good night. God bless.